two aspects here. Do the one, and then we'll do a little bit into the second one, but uh, how the Holy Spirit sanctifies us and how the Holy Spirit secondly fills us. the next couple of weeks because there's a lot more information here than we can cover tonight. So it took us a couple of weeks to get through this. But I came across this, you know, I have files full of sermons I preach and notes and clippings that I keep. And uh, I came across this from Donald Whitney's book, Praying the Bible. Uh, Donald Whitney was one of my professors at Midwestern. Uh, I took his class on spiritual disciplines and a couple other classes with him. He wrote this, and he says, whenever the Holy Spirit enters any person, he brings his holy nature with him. Think about that. Let me say it one more time. Whenever the Holy Spirit enters any person, he brings his holy nature with him. The result is that all those in whom the Spirit dwells have new holy hungers and holy loves. Because you didn't have him before he entered. But now you have new holy hungers and holy loves. They did not have prior to having his indwelling presence. So anybody that is indwelt with the Spirit has new holy hungers and new holy love. And if they don't, guess what you know? They're not indwelt. And if they're not indwelt, that means they're not Because the indwelling is an aspect of salvation, not sanctification. Y'all with me? So I've learned to take people's spiritual temperatures. Are there new holy hungers? And are there new holy loves and passions? And does their life give evidence of that truth? They love fellowship with the people of God. They love fellowship with the people of God. <clears throat> Can't wait to get together with the people of God. Will not let anything get in the way of them getting together with the people of God. Because that's something the Holy Spirit that indwells them pricks and pride. So when people don't come on Wednesday night, guess what I know? Because the indwelling of the Spirit gives you new hungers and loves. And they love fellowship with the people of God. Now, I don't do Sherlock Holmes on your life. Oh, I ain't got nobody following you around. I ain't on the <laughs> internet looking at your credit report. I, I, I don't have your calendar. But I just happen to know, as a shepherd, that people are taking off from jobs and neglecting families to do things that they won't do for Wednesday night or Sunday morning. I just happen to know that. Amen. Because there's another spirit that won't let them miss that stuff. Alright. They love fellowship with the people of God, finding it unimaginable to live apart from a meaningful interaction with them. Amen. It's unimaginable. If I'm going to be any place, if I want to be any place, I want to be with the people of God. 
When we got people, we'd rather be at the ball game, we'd rather be at the cheerleader camp, we'd rather be at little Bay Bay's events, we'd rather be at home watching TV, we'd rather be bowling, we'd rather be playing tennis, paddle ball, pickleball. <coughs> but when it comes to being with the people of God, I got stuff that comes up and gets in the way. And then they wonder why they're not growing. They wonder why their life keeps falling apart and they can't keep together. It's not a mystery. Okay. Hearts and minds, he goes on to say, hearts and minds in which the Holy Spirit dwells fills them with holy longings unknown to them previously. The indwelling of the Spirit changes your longings, your desires your hunger, your love, your passion, direction. I mean, you were neglecting church when you wasn't saved, now you neglect church when you say saved, what changed? You were neglecting the reading of the Bible before you got saved, you are neglecting the reading of the Bible now that you're saved, what really changed? You were going through the motions before you got saved, you're going through the motions since you've been saved, what changed? Because when the Holy Spirit indwells, hearts and minds in which the Holy Spirit dwells fills them with holy longings unknown to them previously. They long to live in a holy body without sin. You should have that longing, even though it may not be your reality. But you long for that. It may not be a reality. But it is a longing. Let me use another word that's a little bit stronger. It's a lust that you have. Because we understand the word lust better than we understand the word longing. It's a strong desire you have. Even though it's not a reality. See, sin, and I've told you this going through 1 Corinthians, sin is a reality in the church. But your longing is to be free from sin. To be untainted from sin. Do we have that longing? Do you, do I, do we have that longing? Paul said it very clearly uh, in Romans chapter 7, who will free me from this body of sin? It's a longing. I want to be free from this. This ain't comfortable anymore. Sin used to be comfortable. Or I used to be ignorant. But I'm no longer ignorant. And I'm no longer comfortable. Because I have a longing. I have a strong desire. A strong lust. To be free. To live in a holy body without sin. They yearn for a holy mind, no longer subject to temptation. They groan for a holy world filled with the holy people. They're no longer comfortable in this world. They're no longer comfortable with the things of this world. You could not be a Christian in Corinth and be comfortable with living in Corinth. You know, I'm studying, I've already pretty much got the sermon done for the next Sunday. Um, remember, in the introduction, we talked, we said that Corinthian, Corinth, and the people of Corinth were known for, to be Corinthianized with men, to be filled with sexual immorality. That's how Corinthians were seen. Because that's what dominated the culture, the city. That's what it was known for. So much so, it was wrapped up in all of the pagan worship services. And people get saved and they try to bring that or their mindset has not changed about that even though they're now part of the body of Christ. But 
there ought to be a, groan, a groaning for a holy world filled with holy people and earnestly desire to see the last face of the one the angels call holy, holy, holy. There is a longing to see Jesus face to face. That's why death really holds no fear for the believer. That's why persecution by many of our brothers and sisters down through time and even today because there's mass persecution of Christians going on across the world, they really view persecution as an exit to what they really long for to see Jesus face to face. So now they can endure the persecution knowing that at the end of the persecution they may see Jesus that much more quick. That is not the mentality we have. We would give the Sunday crucible an answer. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Just don't hurry up. <laughs> Not yet. Wait a minute. I'll call you when I'm ready. I'll send you a text. I'll email you. But I know I'm supposed to give the right Sunday school answer. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. But my life says, whoa, Jesus. There's some things I've yet to accomplish with you in this world that have more interest to me than seeing you face to face. Now, I'm not saying you walk around, kill me now, Jesus, all day long. That's what I'm saying, right? But it's a mindset that I am prepared for death. And I'm not fearful of it in the sense of the, because I know the outcome. Because it really will lead to one of my longings being fulfilled. To see the one the angels call holy, 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 face to face. Is that how we think? Is that our, is that our mindset? Because it is the mindset of the spirit that involves you, is what he's saying. So the spirit's mindset becomes no. your mindset. But we got competing mindsets. The spirit's thinking one way, and we still hanging on mm -hmm. to the other way. Mm -hmm. Then we wonder why we're not being filled. Or sanctified. Get the connection? Yeah. Okay. He says, finally, this is the spiritual heartbeat. Now get this now. Hold on to your seat. You ready? This is the spiritual heartbeat of 100% of the hearts where the Spirit of God lives. Bam! It ain't 95% of people. It ain't 90% of the people. It ain't some of the people. It is 100% of the people have this mindset. And if you don't have this mindset, you're not part of 100% of the people. That's a strong statement. So you sure you say? You sure you can dwell? <coughs> Are you sure you're being sanctified? Am I sure? Combine that statement with what Jesus said, depart from me, I never knew you, it makes it frightening. That's why my guard said that's the, the scariest statement in the Bible. For people who are religious, for church going folk, that's the scariest statement in the Bible. Because we claim Jesus, but if Jesus don't claim you, you yeah. lost. I found Jesus. I didn't know Jesus was lost. I thought you was the lost one. I thought we were the ones lost. I thought he sought us. Out of his very mouth, he said, I came to seek and save those who are lost. But somehow we think we got a GPS and we found Jesus. Like he was lost. And people are finding a Jesus that is a figment of their own imagination. 
because you only find the Jesus of the Bible if he finds you. That makes sense, everybody? Yeah. Okay. And so this is what, this is part of the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's why we need to understand this work or we end up talking in ways the Bible doesn't agree with. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us. She left off the word spirit, but that's what it should say. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us. You don't sanctify yourself. Okay. And this is what's in 1 Corinthians 6, 11. Uh, it says, and such were some of you, and we'll preach to that, we'll get there, guarantee you, coming up. And such were some of you. What you were is not what you are now because of what the Holy Spirit has done in sanctifying you, position. And therefore, position now has to work its way out practically. So we can't habitually be what we were because we are not what we used to be. You got new equipment that you didn't have. <laughs> You got things that have been added to your life that you didn't have before when you were living that lifestyle in a habitual way. And that's when we started the series in the first place. That's why Paul started with, let me get you right in understanding who you are and whose you are. Because you're acting like something that you shouldn't be acting like. And that's why it's important to get the people to understand and making sure they're grounded in who they are and whom they are. So they stop talking like something different. But you were washed. So some of us were like that, he says. And we're, let's go to verse 9, just so we get context. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But Andy Stanley and his church would say, you can be that now. We will receive you into the membership and you're still practicing these kind of lifestyles. And churches all across America and all across the world are doing this. <coughs> the theology now is you don't have to forsake your sin. Because God will receive you just as you are. I had this conversation at the gym with somebody today. And uh, she was coming to visit our church. She found out we were going to be here Sunday, so she didn't come. Uh, she got mad at me. How you asked me to come to the church before you met? And uh, I said, well, I was on vacation. You can come this Sunday. But I won't be preaching. And uh, she said, but, but is it, you know, is it all right? You know, the Bible says, come as you are. I said, well, the Bible doesn't say that. But keep going. And I said, you can come as you are. She was talking about dress. She was talking about how she dressed. She didn't want to get all dressed up. So you don't have to do that. But I, I, sometimes I don't feel like putting on makeup. You don't have to. You can come as you are. You can't stay as you are. It's not about your dress. It's not about your makeup. But you have to come and be prepared for a transformed life. So she says she's still coming, we'll see. Second right. Corinthians 3.18, but we all with unveiled faces beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. There is a transformation that is going on that will culminate or climax when we see Jesus face to face. So positionally, while we are all, we are complete in Christ, practically, we are still being transformed day by day to his glory. Positionally, we are complete, 
but in sanctification we are still being completed. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay. That's what he's doing. Not trying to give you a Cadillac. Not trying to give you a house behind the gated community fence. Not trying to make you happy. He wants to what? Sanctify you. And transform you into the glory <coughs> of Christ himself. So, to be sanctified is to be set apart. That's what the word technically means. To be sanctified is to be set apart. And this is really why you should study your Old Testament, especially the book of Leviticus, as the temples and, and the tools and the instruments and the priest's garments are being prepared, they're being prepared specifically for God because they are to be set apart only for the use of God and not anything else. And this is what Paul is saying in the New Testament. We are vessels of honors. We are no longer vessels of dishonor because we have been set apart. And vessel of dishonor is what you use to throw garbage out in. Vessels of dishonor is what you use as a porter pot. We are no longer that. We are no longer to be vessels where the garbage of this world contaminates us. We are to be vessels of honor. Bring out the china. Bring out the best dishes. Because we are now set apart from what is this. That is what sanctification has as its aim to conform us to the image of Christ. So, to be sanctified is to be set apart from sin unto God for his manifestation and use. But there is teaching today in the church where you don't have to be set apart from sin. God will take you in all your sin and let you keep on sinning. But since he has saved you, it doesn't matter. Grace has got you covered. So sin to your heart's delight. That is actual teaching in churches today. People are not expected to live what the Bible says and what it means by what it means. And there are false teachers, false pastors, false prophets, false you fill in the blank in pulpits, in churches, in the pews, validating that message. The only problem is it's totally contrary to the work what the Spirit is trying to accomplish. So, to be sanctified is to be set apart from sin unto God. So, it's to be set apart from something to something. Don't miss that. Is to be set apart from something to something. All husbands and wives are set apart from someone to someone. For some of us, from a lot of someones to a someone. You can't keep the someones and try to cling to the someone. You aren't going for that, and God's not going for it either. Amen. But there is teaching in the church where people are taught that. First Corinthians 1 2, he reminds them to the church of God, which is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Call to be saints, set apart ones, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. But not only are we to be set apart positionally, but also practically. So we're positionally set apart from sin and everything that goes with that to God. But practically in your daily lives, our daily lives, we are to be set apart from sin to holiness. So practically we're being set apart from sin to holiness. Positionally, you are set apart from sin to God. 
Everybody got that? So we are a holy people, a royal priesthood, he says in Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Paul has already told us in, 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 correct, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we are the temple of the what? Holy Spirit, the place where God dwells. He no longer dwells in temples made with hands, like he did in the Old Testament. He now dwells in and among his people. That has to impact the way you live. If it doesn't, go back to the quote by Donald Whitney. So, we can't reference all the scriptures tonight, but also practically throughout the Christian life as one yields oneself to God and does his will. Okay. My part, your part, is to yield. You know what a yield sign is when y'all drive, right? Nope. Nope. Y'all don't, we don't yield, y'all don't yield? Nope. I kid you not. Well, what is it supposed to mean? As long as traffic is free, keep going. Nope. I mean, I'm just saying. I know traffic don't have to be free. Right in the motor. What does it mean to yield? Slow down, that's it. And wait. And wait. To see you. That's Proceed what it is. with caution. Well, is Proceed with caution. Yeah. So you can sin as long as you proceed with caution. Oh, uh, what? We talking about? I'm talking about yielding. No, we're talking about traffic. I'm talking about <laughs> the traffic of your holy life. Yeah, you just said that. yielding means keep cautiously coming. To be cautious. <laughs> I'm just telling you how. To That's why we don't know how to live. We don't even know how to drive. <laughs> Yield right means away. give the right away. <laughs> there you go, sis. Give the right away. <clears throat> so to yield spiritually means give what? The right, the right away to the spirit and not your sin. <laughs> Amen. The spirit is working, but you just want to drive on through. <laughs> You don't want to drive on through. You just want to drive on through cautiously. <laughs> but you're not giving the right away. <laughs> so to yield is to give the right away to the spirit and not sin. Man, do the right thing. I'm sorry? Do the right thing, right? Okay. Because you come to an intersection where you got to decide do I go with sin or do I yield to the spirit? Yeah. So to yield, we yield to the spirit, yeah. which means we then can't be yielding to sin. sin. That's the idea. Yeah. And that's the play, part you play, and the spirit then empowers you to pull it off. But you must constantly, by act of your will, make the decision. And your will only wills it because you have holy longings and loves. Okay. You see how it all connects together? Yeah. Okay. I don't know how to live the life, Pastor. I don't know how to live it. I'm trying to tell you how to live it. <laughs> the Bible's trying to, the Bible tells you how to live this stuff. Right way. Gosh. There is a part that we play according to Philippians chapter 2. God works in, in you. He wills in you to do his good plan. But you got to work it out. You got to obey the traffic sign. You don't even know what the traffic sign means. The Bible says, stop. We roll. We roll stop. You ain't stop. You just slow down a little bit on through. Stop means stop behind the sign where you can still see the sign. Never. <laughs> Never. We all up in the crosswalk. The line on the ground for a reason. 
<laughs> Your car halfway out in the lane. <laughs> and you call that stopping. No, stopping is not defined by your interpretation. Stopping is defined by the one who made the law. Amen. The, those, those little crosswalks where they got the, the white and that little space, the little white, little space, little, means you see somebody standing on the curb, you're supposed to stop. Well, they know better than jump out front of this car. <laughs> <laughs> How you get a license and you don't know the rules? I just did what they said when they was in the car. Okay. But we do the same thing in church. You tell the truth. We learn just enough in the book to pass the test. We really don't know it and understand it. And so everything is in your short term memory. So that when you get out on the road, you remember a thing that you learned on the test. And that's what y'all do with sermons on Sunday. Short-term memory. Oh, pastor said, you know, pastor don't pass the Bible. We did this. We studied this. We just studied this on Wednesday night about the Spirit. And then you get the test. He said something like, uh, <laughs> Like the scripture was somewhere in Corinth. I don't remember the chapter or the verse, but somewhere it was. Somewhere. And sin just beating you up and down because you don't remember what you need to remember. Yeah. You stopping where you should be yielding. You going where you should be stopping. You tell the truth. <laughs> 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 First Peter 1, 15 and 16 says, but as he called you is holy, but as he who called you is holy, so the one who called you, and the, he is capital, meaning God, Christ, or the Holy Spirit, he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all conduct. How much of your conduct is supposed to be holy? Y'all turn to First Peter because y'all think I made that up. Turn to First Peter chapter one. First Peter chapter one, verse fifteen and sixteen. But as he who called you is holy, notice it's not a capital H; it's a lowercase H. Okay. You also be holy in, and, and, and our translation has your, but in the Greek, it doesn't have your, it just means all conduct. So how much of your conduct or behavior or your attitude and actions and activity is supposed to be holy? All of it. How much of your activities, attitudes, and actions are holy? Some of it. Yeah, because it, the cap, the holiness that pertains to God. See, when, we, when the angels cry, holy, 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 that's all capital H's. Because we're talking about God, who has no defilement. We are to be set apart, but we still have remnants of sin in us. So we can't have a capital H, but because we've been positionally, and now we're practically practicing holiness, we are to reflect the set apartness, the holiness of God, even with our fault. But we're not ultimately holy yet. That's glorification. Because we're talking about sanctification. Everybody with me? See, if you are capital H holy, you would never have to, you have to be sanctified. You would never have to do 1 John 1 9, confess your sins, because you would never have any sins to confess. Because God don't have any sins to confess. Because he is holy, holy, holy. Okay, that's the difference. So we're talking about sanctity. So we have to set ourselves apart for him. Because we realize we're vessels of honors for God's use. So we're setting ourselves apart 
from sin to holiness in our sanctification. Positionally, from sin to God, in our sanctification, from sin to holiness. Okay? Did I ask the question? Yes. Thank you. No problem. First Thessalonians 4 3, for this is the will of God. Anybody want to know what the will of God is? Well, first Thessalonians 4 3 gives you one of them. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. So what's one of God's will for us as his children? To be set apart. Set apart from what? Sin to God. holiness. You know, you've already been set apart from holiness. sin to God in your position. Practically. From sin to holiness. So what is an aspect of holiness for us as believers or followers of Christ? And this is what he gives us. He says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from what? Sexual immorality. So that's one of the ways we practice holiness. We abstain from, and that's God's will for us in our sanctification. But when you know it, church can rent, got people who ain't practicing that. Right. Just like we got people in the church who are not practicing that. Okay. First Thessalonians 4 7. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but to holiness. When God called you, he just didn't call you to be holy positionally. That's a done deal by him. He called you also to be what? Holy, practically. And we take in a lot of unholy stuff, don't we? Yep. Yep. We don't even ask the question, is this a holy show or an unholy show? Mm -hmm. Is this holy music or unholy music? Is this a holy movie or unholy movie? We don't watch and we don't sift through things that way. And so we sit there and we're grieving the Holy Spirit the whole time. We're quenching the Holy Spirit the whole time. Which means you are not being sanctified. You're only being sanctified when we allow the Holy Spirit to do the sanctification work. By being set apart from that which is sin to that which is holy. So you got to be careful what kind of music you're listening to. What is it talking about? Is it calling women everything but what God says they really are? Then you shouldn't be listening to that. Is it talking about how we should romantically love our husband and love our wives? And you're not married, then you shouldn't be listening to that. Because you ain't got nobody you can live that out with. You're just filling yourself with temptation. Whereas the person that's married has someone they can live that out with. That's how you have to work through this. So romantic songs that might be okay for a married couple may not be all right for a single person. Because it just builds up in you desires that you can't fulfill. But if it's not building those desires, then you may have liberty to listen or to watch. That's how you work through it. Yeah. And that's why you got to forget some of the old songs. Because attached to the old songs is some old memories that don't look like the one you with right now. So you can't pull out the old mixtape. <laughs> Talk about I'm reminiscing about the old days. Who are you reminiscing about with in the old days? This is how you have to work through this. Now if you can do it and you're not reminiscing, <coughs> but I just have to take that. That those old memories didn't die when you got married. Right. <laughs> Ooh, I remember exactly where I was when I first heard that song. And you remember who you were with. 
And you remember what y'all were doing. <laughs> You're going too far. Okay. What world view is it coming from? What world view is this movie, this this TV show, this this game show, this song? What world view is it expressing? Pastor, that's, that's too much work. Work out your salvation. <laughs> it's supposed to be work. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> I was listening. I'm trying to, you know, do this right. So I'm watching shows about animals, for God's sake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 yeah, but then it annoyed me because then they keep talking about how we evolved from like monkeys. Mm -hmm. And then they said we even kangaroos have to evolve into it. I'm like, well, are you serious? Yeah, yeah. Understood. I understand. understood. That's where the world is. I can't even watch a show about animals. Well, animals, and then they make animals equal yeah. to human beings. They call them our cousins. No, they are not. There are some people who value animals by <laughs> more than by humans. They want to save the puppies and kill the babies in the womb. But, and I'm not, and I'm saying we just have to be thinking so that they're not impressing upon us their worldview. So when you go to the movies, go to the movies, but don't just sit there and let them feed you their worldview. Right. Right. Well, I just go to the movie to be entertained. You know, you go to, you, you want to be sanctified. So you don't want anything impressing a worldview upon you that's going to contradict your salvation and you're not aware and alert. We're supposed to be alert people. It's too much work. Work out your salvation in fear and dream. Amen. It is work. See, we just want to float. Glide. Get in the spirit of the car and ride. <laughs> Let Jesus worry about all the details. <coughs> Take the wheel. <laughs> no responsibility. Right. But we have responsibility. Amen. Okay. To become holy in behavior is to be increasingly like the Lord Jesus. That's the ultimate picture. To become holy in behavior is to be increasingly like the Lord Jesus. Go to first John with me on this. He says in verse 5 of 1 John, chapter 1, this is a message from when we heard from him and declared to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So what are we becoming like? What are we becoming like? Light. Less and less of darkness. Positionally, that's been accomplished. But now i got to accomplish it practically. Okay. Because I'm being sanctified. I'm being set apart. You are set apart positionally, but now you have to be set apart practically in your daily living. From sin to holiness. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So I say I have fellowship with God. I say I have a relationship with God. I say I have a partnership with God. He walks in light, I walk in darkness. How is that a partnership? It's like a husband and wife say, we're going to hold hands and signify that we have fellowship, but you walk on the left side of the street and I walk on the right side of the street. How are you going to hold hands? God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. We have been born with the ability to reflect that light, but yet we're walking in darkness. And John says, you're lying to yourself. But notice the key phrase that people often miss. Verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship. There's a lot of people saying they, they love Jesus. They know Jesus. They got fellowship with Jesus. Yeah. 
but how they live contradicts what they're saying. You can say anything. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't I? And Jesus is going to say what? So what you say don't matter. If your life does not reflect a bit inconsistently what you say. Verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son, cleanses us from all sin. So there is a constant cleansing effect that goes on as we are walking in the light and we are walking in the light with others who are walking in the light. It's a continuous action of being cleansed. And if I'm continuously being cleansed, then I can't stay dirty. See, some of y'all didn't get that. If I'm continuously being cleansed, I can't stay dirty. If I'm continually walking in the light, I can't be walking in the darkness. But we ping pong Christians. I'm on the light side of the table, then I'm hit over to the dark side of the table. I'm on the light side of the table, then I'm hit over to the No, no, it's a continuous action. where I can't go to the other side of the table. Okay. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives also. If we say, verse 8, we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, you, you can't say it until you confess you got sin issues. Or you got a sin problem. And the problem is we live in a culture where there is no longer sin. People don't need to be saved from sin because they're not sinful, they're just sick. And so sick people don't need salvation, sick people need healing and psychology and sociology and a better environment. So people are willing to confess they're sick, they're not willing to confess they're sinful. See, people aren't evil, they're just ill. See, we're not evil. I just got issues. So help me deal with my issues. And the problem is, the issues are unlimited. Amen. It's like the commercial on TV. Take this medicine, but the medicine you take, you got 18 symptoms, it's going to make it worse than what you're taking the medicine for. Yep. That's what it says. If you just deal with issues, it just complicates and creates other issues. But now if you're evil, we got something that can solve that. It won't create any issues for you either. Yes? No. Nope. Okay. So you have to confess that you have a sin problem. Yes. Or that sin is a problem. Yes. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we call it what he calls it, it ain't a sickness, it ain't an illness, it ain't the culture, it ain't your environment, it ain't the fact that your mom and daddy didn't do for you all that mom and daddy's supposed to do. It ain't none of that. You got a sin problem. And until you confess that, we can't go past go. You try to get around the board, why are you under, why are you always in, land up, and land up landing on, go to jail. And never can pass, go get your $200. Because you got a problem that will always end you up in jail. No matter how you roll the dice, it's going to come up, go to jail.
But if you come to D, you can get around the novel board, end up on Park Avenue, and build you some hotels. It is to move away from the old lifestyle, to, be, to, 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 to become holy behavior is increasingly, increasingly like, be increasingly like the Lord. It is to move away from the old lifestyle that we had when we were unsaved, to conform to the will of God, and to display the moral qualities of Jesus. And that's, that's the goal, to display the moral qualities, not the God-like qualities. You will never be omnipotent. Oh, no. You will never be omnipresent. Oh, no. You will never be able to speak to the waves and they become perfectly calm. Yeah. But you can be morally like Jesus. Yes. Yes. And that's the goal. See, people run around talking about we like Jesus and we can do all the stuff that Jesus did in the miracles. That's not the part that was passed on but the moral qualities of Jesus, the longing to do the will of the Father, the kingdom objective and objectives as a focus of life, those become yours because you're becoming more and more like Christ. Does that make sense to everybody? And it changes your priorities. It changes your passion. It changes everything. <laughs> These are illustrations I want to use, I won't use because y'all be mad. No, I gotta get past Pastor anniversary first. <laughs> if it's if we're becoming more like Christ, morally, and we're becoming more like Christ in the passion for the kingdom. Uh, agenda, to use Tony's phrase, mm -hmm. and the things that please God. Would Jesus come to Wednesday night, or would He go somewhere else? Wait, say that one more time. Right. <laughs> if you're becoming more like Jesus morally, and in your passions and values and priorities, would Jesus come to Wednesday night gathering, or would He go somewhere else? Then why we go somewhere else? <laughs> because the goal is to become more like him. Right. <laughs> then why are you making decisions he would not make? Why do you have priorities he would not have? Why do you value what he didn't value? If you're becoming more like yeah. and that's what the work of the Holy Spirit is doing is making you more like yeah. Yeah. you're not trying to become like Pastor Clay that ain't in the Bible you only model Pastor Clay Pastor Strong as long as they're modeling Christ But you're not trying to become like us. You're trying to become like Christ. And we're just supposed to be examples of that so you see it's possible. But then y'all say, we can't be like you. God didn't want to be like that. I'm not Pastor Clay. What do you mean by that? Are you like Christ? Or are you like the Christ that Pastor Clay Pastor Sean illustrated? I tell you, I've been work, I'm working on a sermon. Working on a sermon because I hear that a lot. I hear that a lot. 
So okay. you know, I just asked God, what, what do I need to go to deal with that? And he, 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 he reminded me of Moses. Who made Moses like Moses? And then God told Moses, find men of this kind of character, and I will take your spirit and put it on them. So who made Moses like Moses? Who would make the men like Moses? What do you mean you can't be like Moses? See, we say stuff we don't know we kind of did in the Bible. It makes sense to us in our human thinking. Remember, Moses says, I can't talk. Yep. What did God ask him? Who made your mouth? <laughs> what do you mean you can't talk? <laughs> Who made your <laughs> If I put my words in your mouth, then you can say what I'm sending you to say. What, what? <laughs> See, y'all read, we read these stories, we don't get it. It's just bedtime stories. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a moment. Wait a moment. Yeah, you, just, you just gotta, you know, get with God. <laughs> I chose you, Moses, to lead my people. And you telling me you ain't qualified. <laughs> so what you're really telling me, Moses, I made a bad choice. <laughs> this conversation sounds. I don't know what I'm doing, Moses. I mean, I'm living to God, and I didn't know you wasn't qualified. But I came and told you anyway. How stupid am I? <laughs> That's the way it is. <laughs> Read the text. Moses has given God all these reasons why he shouldn't be the one. I can't talk. Wait, wait, wait. Yep. You're lying, Moses. I said that. You was raised in Pharaoh's house. I know you know all kinds of languages. What do you mean you can't talk? You led men in Egypt, in building programs, in war. What do you mean you can't leave? You commanded legions. You commanded men. You commanded people in the palace. What do you, what do you, what do you? Because he murdered someone. Yeah, that's what I don't know. Ah. Well, let's tell the truth and shame the devil. Tell me you just don't want to and then we can get to the truth. But don't tell me you can't and that I made a mistake in choosing you. Like God don't know what he is doing. And that's all that's behind it. The question is, who made your mouth? You forgot I created you. What do you mean? You forgot I'm the one who gifts people. But you tell me I make a mistake, don't know what I'm doing. And then go find other men who have these characteristics or this character, and I will take your spirit and put it on them. And the spirit I'm going to put on them is the spirit I put on you that I gave you. So why are we saying we can't do what we were chosen to do? <coughs> when it's the same Holy Spirit that's doing the doing. I don't always respond to the stuff y'all say. Because y'all would run me about a dive if I responded to everything like I just responded. But I'm thinking it. You need to know, I'm thinking it. And I'm saying, God, what is the right moment? Because every moment is not the right moment. But I'm thinking it. Do these people not realize they're contradicting 
who you are and that you are the source that you made their mouth that you chose them that you elect them that you did all the things that Pastor Strong was talking about in the two messages and they're saying something different than what you say and they don't even realize it no wonder we can't get past go Stuck on Baltic Avenue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like Monopoly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. 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 That was a way over. <laughs> <laughs> Got no Monopoly to hear. <coughs> Park places where the rich folk live, Baltic is where the poor folk live. Yeah. 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 You don't want Baltic. Yeah. Want... <laughs> <laughs> Margaret Gardens is the middle class people. Come on, house play Monopoly sometime. We'll help you out. The experience to experience this, we must separate ourselves from attitudes and behaviors. And this is this is why I said what I just said. You got to separate yourself from those kind of attitudes and behaviors and thoughts. The gospel. Or you won't be being sanctified. To experience this work of the Spirit so that we have holy behavior, so that we're conformed to the will of God, so we display the moral qualities. To experience this, we must separate ourselves from attitude behaviors that are unlike Jesus. You can't talk contrary to Jesus and be like Jesus. You can't talk contrary to God and be like God. You can't talk contrary to the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and be like the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Then I say something and y'all get twisted. Y'all don't think y'all get twisted. <laughs> but y'all get twisted. <laughs> Faces change. Eyes roll. <coughs> necks twist. Body shudder. Faces shut. I know what people shut. I raise kids. I know all the signs. <laughs> Been married. I know all the signs. <laughs> Live with myself. 60 something. I know all the signs. Yeah. Yeah. Are you upset? No, I ain't upset. Are you lying? <laughs> <laughs> Did what I just said bothered you? No, I'm okay. No, you ain't. Right. We ain't gonna fight about it right now, but I know. You are now having attitudes, behavior that will hinder your being sanctified. Because now you're grieving and quenching the spirit. And he does the sanctifying work. Anybody getting this beside you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, to experience this, we must separate ourselves from attitudes and behaviors that are unlike Jesus and give ourselves to that which expresses him. Yield. Yield. Abstain from. Flee from. Turn from. Stop. Don't roll stop. Stop. Don't get halfway out in the intersection and say, oh, oh. There's going to be an accident. Because you got other people that ain't yielding either. Right. So when y'all fussing and fighting when we come up here, I know people roll right through the heel signs. And that's where there's a collision in the middle of the sanctuary. Amen. Sister so-and-so is mad at sister so-and-so. <laughs> Talking under her breath about sister, the brother so and so. Don't fellowship with brother so and so. Don't call, don't text, don't get together with. Because people kept rolling through the yield sign, they rolled through the stop sign, and there's a mass collision in the middle of this church. Oh, I know how we got there. I know how we got there. I just don't always say something. 
especially on Sunday morning. I don't do a lot on Sunday morning because I got to be in the right. I'm focused on one thing, the message. Worship and the message. Nothing gets in the way of that. Nothing. You are not getting me out of the spirit because y'all collision and colliding in the middle of it. We'll deal with that. But people will get you out. Man, what you say? If you don't come right. <laughs> Some of us leave home not right. We don't even want to get church not be right. And because you didn't leave right, when you get here, you don't have the spirit filling you to respond right to things that you face when you come here or when you go to your job or when you have a tragedy in your life or you have fill in the blank because we're not filled we're not some of us are just not being sanctified in church serving giving doing all that none of that stuff sanctifies you people who aren't saved do all that stuff every Sunday. But to be like Christ, to reflect light in the midst of darkness, to reflect the moral character of Christ, to be controlled by the will of the Father can only be produced by the sanctified one. And here, the Holy Spirit brings this sanctification about as we respond to his prompting, his prompting instruction and discipline. The Holy Spirit brings this sanctification about as we respond to his prompting instruction and discipline. The Holy Spirit brings this about only when, only if, we respond <coughs> correctly Same. to his prompting, instruction, and discipline. You don't respond properly, you still don't get sanctification. <coughs> so that's the danger <laughs> in thinking just because you heard information that that's enough. You gotta respond. You gotta respond. That's why sometimes after the sermon, it's just good to stay in the pew. You know, I'll think about it when I get home. And the birds come and eat the seed before you get out the door. Somebody that irritated you before you got out the door. Life hits you before you get out the door. We get busy doing church activity and spend no time responding. There's a reason why I don't spend much time upstairs after the service. A couple of reasons. One, I'm depleted, spiritually speaking. To believe, I gotta go get refilled. My tank is empty. Not just physically, not just emotionally, just I'm, I know I'm depleted spiritually because the work is spiritual work. Secondly, I gotta go deal with myself. What you gonna do with this earth? Now, I've been doing that all week. But God says, here's one you didn't see. <laughs> here's an aspect you didn't quite understand. That you now understand what you're gonna do. 
<laughs> well, God, you know, can we deal with that on Monday? <laughs> don't work that way because I'm going to be doing spiritual work normally some more so if I wait till Monday I'm depleted and not being sanctified the whole time till Monday and you might get any kind of reaction because <laughs> you're mentally drained yes. you're emotionally drained and you're spiritually drained. And people have no clue. Ask what? Let me ask you about 15 questions before you go downstairs. <laughs> Most of it had nothing to do with sermon. Now, you politely try to do the best you can, but you ha I have to be careful. Because I am depleted. I understand that. There's been a spiritual warfare going on that you aren't seeing in the heavens, in my soul, in my mind, in my heart. There's a battle to say this is trying to get you distracted so you can't properly communicate. If you don't properly communicate, then the people don't get anything. All that is happening. <coughs> Pastor, it don't look like you'd be struggling. But well, what's it supposed to look like? What you want to see? If you know how to win the victory, what do you want to see? Amen. Amen. The question would be, if all that's going on, because I'm experiencing the same thing, Pastor, mm -hmm. how do you make it look so easy? It's not really easy, but how do you make it look like it's easy? Because I've learned how Fight You all should learn how to fight the battle. Because we're all bad. Some of y'all battle and we can tell. Some of you battle and we can't tell. <laughs> Now, the reason we can't tell for some of y'all because you ain't really in the war. You on the damn side, so ain't nothing to battle. Oh. <laughs> he ain't attacking you. Yeah. <laughs> some don't battle because they've learned how to win. <laughs> and those are the people you want to find and get next to. Yes, sir. <laughs> Any questions on any of that? We'll stop there. <coughs> Any questions?